I'm not sure how you start. Well, I thought maybe we go. I might have delegated that. So if I'm telling you it's not, I just leave myself. I don't even take pictures. <laughs> Father, we thank you for this time together as we explore what it's like, what the, what the, uh, what Paul, how he taught, how he led, how he ministered to people. Lord, as we come upon the, the elections coming up, as we deal with all the, the strife that seems to be going on in our world today, Help us to learn from Paul how to live as Christians as a minority. Thank you, Father, for the record that Paul kept for us. Thank you for his wisdom and his, his examples. Thank you, Father, and why you do. Um, I want to jump back <coughs> a little bit. We left off last time on Acts 18. Nine. Actually, we had just gotten to the fact that we saw that it was red letters in there, yeah. in Acts. And one of you said, "Is Jesus there?" And his words were definitely, "The Lord spoke to Paul in a vision." Mm -hmm. And so the words there were the Lord's. He says, "Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you." And no one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed for a year and a half teaching them the word of God. We had just set the scene last time when Paul was on, um, basically on that stone of insolence. And here sits the, other, the, the jury sitting over on the, the stone of no, of no uh, mercy. And we heard that that was the same place where Socrates had been condemned to die. And Paul was allowed off. They let him go. And there was a guy there, um, Gallo, who was the proconsul of Achaia. And he was sort of like Pilate was in Jerusalem, not quite as high. He represented the Roman government. He was as high as they came on that. But he was one who had to keep peace, basically, in that area. But he had some choice in how to do it. And so the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him into the court. This man they charged is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law, just as it was in Socrates. So what did Gallo, Gallo say to them? How was he different than, than Pilate? You look at 18, 14-ish. Yeah. Basically, he tries to, uh, he pushes them off because he considers it a matter that's internal to the church and they should handle it themselves. The same way that, you know, essentially uh, the council in Jerusalem had initially been told by uh, Pilate, you know, this isn't my jurisdiction. And so they tried Herod, you know, they, they tried all the time pushing off, you know, avoiding responsibility, but they want, here's what we want you to do. Why would he do that? I think the spirit moved him to do it. That's the only answer, you know. Obviously, he, he was a pol pol politician, so the inclination probably would have been, well, give these people, keep them happy what they want, you know. Keep us Keep them happy is what a huge is, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because politicians don't like upheaval. No. And especially if you've got something like Rome hanging over your shoulder. And he probably learned from Pilate that this you have to be a little careful about what's going on. If you don't handle this right, it could be a real can of worms. So this is a political type situation. And he ended up having the Jews ejected from the course, the court. Um, and so who, what happened to the guy who brought the charges? Was he well received? 
your question last time. The only other spot I could find Athens actually mentioned was in Acts um, 23. It just mentions there's one spot it just mentions Acts um, um, Athens again, but it doesn't say anything more about it. So I went. I, I particularly started off by looking at the concordance, the, the Strong's. To see how many places Athens was written, there's only other one one other spot in the section right here. Mm -hmm. And I did do some research too. Uh, I went to the Greek and the Roman Catholic Church because I knew they have things on that. And I know <coughs> that there was the bishop, there was a bishop from Athens that was at the Nicene Council. Mm -hmm. But there were places too where it said that the the various uh, temples eventually returned over into Christian. They were rededicated as Christian ones. And like the Parthenon for a while was the Hagia Sophia, which now there is the Hagias or Hagias or whatever. It's a, the Temple of Wisdom, basically, mm -hmm. in Istanbul. It's that same name. This is the one that was in Athens. Um, there were various bishops. We read about the one in our, in our uh, readings last week where he was later made the bishop of Athens and there were a series of bishops but a lot of it there were and he was very likely a martyr too there weren't too many martyrs listed and the reason they gave for that is that it wasn't a huge church it was more like little house churches and also persecution was more intellectual than it was physical for the people there so I don't know if that kind of answers it on that. Thank you. So. In a way, is that's rather true of today. Our persecution here is more intellectual than physical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At least at this time. You know. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Right here in America. Yeah. In other places, that's not true, but here. Yes. Right. But I mean, here, where yeah. we're, we're living. So how do we deal with that? Like Pastor says, you have to, we have to stay firm in the Word. We have to have to just keep keep praying and keep stating the truth. Mm -hmm. I mean, within your with your own families, there's you know there's division. You know, they call themselves Christians, but some don't believe in creation as a whole. But if you don't believe in creation, then you can't accept Psalms because Psalms refers to creation and so then what are you going to choose and pick what you believe in but yeah start right genesis one right interestingly um i do that we all do i know it was the fact that back in, in athens what they were taught to do was construct truth. They came up with their own ideas of what truth was. We have what God says the truth is, <coughs> and it is the truth. And the whole, one of the major themes of the Bible is that light and dark, the coming to the truth versus falsehood. And we have the truth, but sometimes we're hesitant to share the truth because we are told that that's arrogant if we say we have no truth. It's not our truth, though. That's the difference. We didn't construct it. We can't take credit for it. But what God tells us... Well, and, and if somebody else has, has <clears throat> the, um, the right to say what they think, what they believe, then we also have the right to say what we think and what, what we believe in a in a loving way. Mm -hmm. You know, and just I have a I have a, a nephew that I spoke to well this was quite a while ago and he just he can't you know, he, he just can't can't accept all this, you know. And I, I said, Well my God is my God is so big 
He's so powerful. He's so wonderful that I I have to question, you know, what he, what he says. We learned last week some steps that Paul took. We'll see this again and again and again. What was the first one he took when he came to Athens and went into that kind of a culture? To find out where they Listen. were. To find out where they were at. He listened, didn't he? Mm -hmm. He asked questions and he listened. And once he had established that, then he could begin to build. And often the asking questions were often the way that he could open someone's eyes to see the darkness. Um, he used that, where are you first? And that was what we talked about a lot last week, was where are you? And uh, that's what we discussed then. So now he's coming into a little bit different culture here on this one. And in this one, um, they had met a man named Apollos. Yeah, this is kind of where we're picking up from today. Um, what do you know about Apollos? He was a believer. He was a believer. He was one of those God fearers, wasn't he? He was, had been a Jewish person. He was a God fearer. Where was he from? Egypt, Alexandria. What do you know about Alexandria? It was the cultural, the intellectual capital of mm -hmm. the area. And how did he get that? And a big library. And a big library. And they also was, their particular culture was one where they really liked to look at things as allegory type things, mm -hmm. allegorical. They liked to look at the meaning underneath. And they, that was the side of where they had written the Septuagint. Do, do, do you, any of you know what the Septuagint is? It's the first translation, the Greek translation of the Hebrew. Okay, why is it called the Septuagint? First, seventy something. Yeah, there were seventy scholars that they brought together, and the seventy scholars were, according to tradition, is each scholar was put in a different room, so they were separate. We do know that they were separated, and they each translated the Hebrew Bible. And it was the whole Hebrew Bible, books that we don't even have in our Bible, too. They also had those down. And when they got done, they compared the translations. And according to tradition, they were identical. Which to them verified the fact that there was, God had helped them to do this. That they were guided in their translations. And actually, often if you're reading the reading in the New Testament and you come across a quote from the, in the old, of the Old Testament in the New Testament and you go back and you look at your Psalms or something like that, they don't quite match up. The basic idea is there, but it's a little different. Probably if you look you'll find out it's from the Septuagint and usually it's a, a LXX, which means 70. That's what that means, that that's the translation from. Uh, a lot of our Bibles, like the NIV and some of the others, go right back to the original Hebrew and the original Greek. But a lot of the translations came from the Septuagint. They went to the Greek Septuagint translation and translated it into English from that. So it, it, it was a very uh, accurate, I mean, it was done by the scholars of the day, the Hebrew uh, spot scholars and translated it into Greek. Why did they translate it into Greek? Greek was the ruling authority for the entire region after Alexander at that time. Yeah. So that's why. So. And, and, the, and the language stuck. Yeah, the language stuck even while it was Rome. Because people, this was the, the language, much like English is right now, it's the business language. If you want to do business, international business, you spoke Greek. So he was trained very strongly in, um, he knew that Septuagint well. He was a very learned man. And he sounds like he really desired to, to serve God. Where was his weakness? He didn't know, obviously, know all of it. Or didn't have it correct. Well, what was missing? Was it the resurrection? The resurrection and the uh, Holy Spirit. 
He didn't understand the Holy Spirit. Like he says, I've been baptized. And Paul said, Who whose baptism did you have? And he said, I had John. John's baptism. Now John's baptism was one of repentance. Mm -hmm. You know, you ask repent and be baptized. What's the difference between when Jesus baptized? Because he actually forgives your sins. And the Holy Spirit brings you to faith. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Baptism is with the Holy Spirit. With the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. we, we, we do the triune God, don't we, that Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In fact, at um, when Jesus was baptized, all three were there. Jesus the Son was in the water. God the Spirit, God, God the Father spoke. God the Spirit descended as the dove. All three were there. It's one of the times when we see the three, the Holy, the triune God together. And Jesus' repentance, Jesus' baptism brings grace and power. John's baptism brought repentance. It's sort of like, you know, getting the car but forgetting to put the motor in it. Mm -hmm. It looks good and everything else, but you've got to do a lot of work to push that baby down the road. If you put the motor in it, that's sort of like the Holy Spirit. That's a mm -hmm. rough analogy far from it. But, um, John's preaching contained a threat. Yeah, this was the law. This was the law. Jesus has brought the grace. The good news. John's rested on the hope to come. Jesus is on what was already accomplished. And it, it, we need to recognize both of those. We need to recognize our sinful nature, nature as well as what Christ brought to us. But there's a real big difference in it. So how did he learn this? Did Paul sit down and give him a good lecture, or what, is, what happened? Oh, I'm going to Priscilla and Priscilla. Mm -hmm. Which there's a real lesson right there. Right. What What did you get out of that? People like us, maybe. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think, well, that's the pastor's job. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't. It's each one of us, too, saying, you know, there was a difference. You were just saying, my God is big. He's strong. Mm -hmm. He can do anything. And helping them to understand that, that we can have that power too. That it welds within us. It's very That's why it's important to have relationships with other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because then, then you can, you, you feel comfortable with each other. And you, you can, can help them along. Like your friend Henry, that time, was raised mm -hmm. Catholic, and he said he, he didn't know he was, if he was really going to heaven. So mm -hmm. we just looked up all kinds of Bible verses and assured him, and he went from being a Roman Catholic to being a Baptist. And I said, well, Henry, how can you have become a Lutheran? <laughs> <laughs> and what did he say? <laughs> Brand. Brand, you know. I think they like the church they went to. <laughs> but, but there is a difference in that. And this was something that, that was very important that was put in here. Um, it, this is not just Paul's book. You know, we can often yeah. think it's just Paul as the example, but it also is the people. And they begin to do this. We see that Priscilla and Aquila were very important to that early church. Um, Paul went to places and then he left it in the care of other people. We can often end up almost worshiping a pastor. Uh, we were in a church where that became almost the danger at one point in time. And then he, we discovered he had very clay feet and a devastating church. It really says something about the power of the Holy Spirit, too, that Apollos, who is known as being well-versed in Scripture, was willing to listen. Mm -hmm. A man at that time, he would have a woman and a man yes. say to him, 
you've got this messed up, here's the real story, mm -hmm. and he listened to them, only the Holy Spirit could get a man to do that. And you also have, you know, these, the, you know, these were tent makers, they were craftsmen, I mean, they were uh, business owners too, but they weren't necessarily known as scholars. And, and the brain, remember, we studied that last week about how important that was to them. And these were people <coughs> who worked with their hands, and he listened to them. So um, I, I don't know that that was really too much in our lesson, but I think the idea that that this was a, a group, a the, the work of the people in the church is very, very important here. Very important. Um, the fact that he that Apollo was eloquent wasn't what gave him power. It was the spirit that did. Um, it said in our faith here, it says that uh, those with knowledge have a responsibility to pass it on. I underlined that and circled that. It's not an option. That's on our, well, maybe it's actually in the, the uh, leaders one. I'll, I'll read you one sec here. This is obviously multi-layered. In Christ, we are always learning, and the relationship of Priscilla and Priscilla and Apollos provides an excellent example of how those with knowledge have a responsibility to pass it on. Further, it is a fine example of how clergy and laity have a great deal to learn from each other. This account also speaks to the important place that encouraging those with ability has in the life of the church. One other person who, one other thing about the church in Ephesus, it's kind of an interesting little thing, um, is that uh, that tradition says that that's where John, the apostle, brought his uh, Mary, the mother of Christ, mm -hmm. to live. And there, if you go to visit there, you can go to Mary's house. Now, the Catholic Church doesn't call it authentic necessarily, but they say it's sort of sacred, but not. They don't. It doesn't have its highest level. But um, one of the things too about Apollos, just a little, a little thought about him too, is because he had really studied the Old Testament and the way that they had studied it, looking at the hidden meanings and the the. Uh, things underneath of it, he would have seen Jesus all the way through it. He maybe wouldn't have known and said, oh, that's who this was talking about. That's probably more what happened, you know. He didn't know who it was until someone opened his eyes and said, what you have been studying all these times is Jesus. And we find that with people too, that they're hungry for something. Um, I've heard it said too, I don't know if it's actually Lutheran or not, but we're all born with a God-shaped hole. <laughs> <laughs> and we're searching for something to fill it. I mean, some people try to cram down drugs, they try to cram down uh, learning, they try to cram down money or power or whatever else, and it doesn't fill that hole. The only thing that fills it is God, or in this case, Christ. And um, we need something to fill that, and we sometimes see other things to do it. One of the things, too, is the Eastern Orthodox Church today still uses the Septuagint. It's just another little book that I've gone on that, too. It's very interesting. So let's go on. Um, we come along he called together the workmen there's a riot first of all let's get there and before that even let's I'll it back up just a little further to there's in the verse 11 19 11 what happened here Paul's 
garments of his. Who was doing the healing? God. God was. God was. Yeah. God was. Yeah, I don't know if any of your translations has anything on that about that, but it's it's kind of implied that that's that would be definitely the case that God was the one that did the healing. It wasn't the items that did the healing. No. It was God doing the heal the the healing, and part of that had to do with the fact that this is what people were kind of expecting to happen, and maybe God used that. Does He use that much today? Right, which is that God did this through Paul. Through Paul, okay. Okay. Well, he does healing today through doctors, mm -hmm. through prayer, of course. Now the Catholic Church still does have things that they have objects that you know they'll bring in and supposedly heal. Yeah, sure. But actually, it's not the object that's doing the healing. No. <clears throat> Not at all, it's God. Mm -hmm. There are some Protestant churches talk about having healing services mm -hmm. where they, they have a service like we do on Sunday and Wednesday is healing night. Yeah, do we need to have a service like that? Do we need to? Well, aren't all our services kind of healing? Mm -hmm. But I, I think they specifically, specifically say, are you bring your illness or whatever your problem is there, and we'll pray over that. Two miracles still happen. Sure. Sure. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. sure. Well, that's not, it's not wrong for, if, if somebody has an illness, if you ask your pastor and, and deacons and whatnot mm -hmm. to pray over you, that's, that's. You do it every Sunday. But I mean, if you want it personal, you know, like if you're struggling with, with oh, an yeah. illness and you ask for personal prayer, mm -hmm. and that, that or is to one, be anointed, and that is one of the spiritual gifts. Is, is, is that wrong to be anointed? To ask to be anointed? What does that mean? Well, you know, how, with with oil. This is going to really sound weird, but once when Sarah was little, she had just terrible diarrhea. I mean, it was it was horrible, and it went on for a long time. And finally, I prayed over her, and I anointed her with oil, and two days she was better. You know, I don't know if it was just the, uh, but it was just I was just. You felt better. Yeah, I did. I did. And she did too. Yeah, yeah she did. I don't know if it was her cause or somebody. <laughs> <laughs> it was just time for it to end. Yeah. You, you know, uh, I think you said, is it wrong? It is wrong when it, when I then say, come and see me, I'll heal you. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's when it's wrong. Right. Because right. it's right. not you that's doing it. No. Right. Right. To yes. give glory to God, yeah. you know, that. For, for everything, we probably don't give God enough glory as it is, and end up taking too much credit on ourselves. ourselves yeah. but one thing is that often miracles happen when we when we hand it over to God, mm -hmm. and we we take a step back ourselves. And um, I mean, I know in my own life that there's been times when I've said, "God, they're yours," you know, that things have happened afterwards, and. A blessing, when they used to in the Old Testament particularly, would anoint someone with oil. It was a handing someone over to God. So there's kind of that aspect of it in that. Um, I mean, I wouldn't want to be like Aaron where the oil is dripping down his ear. And the, the, too much oil. I too much oil. I think you really hit on it is that you're giving God. You're asking God to do it, and then you give God the credit. It is a spiritual gift. Healing is a spiritual gift, and there are people who are able to, uh, I don't want to say connect with God in a way that he says, you know, through you I will heal. But they are people who also are very good about making sure that they recognize it's not them that do it. There are still miracles that occur. And I think if we start doing like what you were just saying and things too, that there are things that just defy medical science and so on and so forth that when someone has prayed, we thought. Not only medical, but I just saw the movie Sully. And if that was a miracle, that plane 
landed safely and all those people <coughs> saved. I mean, it, it was amazing, this, mm -hmm. this film. If you haven't seen it, I certainly recommend it. It's, it's um, really, really very good. And, um, well, God wasn't mentioned too much. I mean, they were praying, you know, all of them on the plane. In fact, I understood the, way, the hostesses to say, pray, pray, and bend your head, or you know, go down, pray, pray. And th that's just, um, it, it just was amazing. Probably some of the people I never prayed before did that day. <laughs> exactly, yeah. We well, you know, a pilot tell you to pray. Yeah. We, we, when we went to Haiti, we rode this little plane to Haiti. It was a cargo plane, basically, with a few cha chairs in it. And we all prayed before we took off with the pilot. He came back and prayed with us. We thought, oh, what are we God. getting into? <laughs> <laughs> important that we realize that God can still heal. Um, then, then we get into this business about the other people around that began to try to copy or mm -hmm. were doing other things. Those that were demon possessed. And what did uh, what did Paul do here? Someone just start reading the 13 and maybe through 16. And some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to pronounce the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. Then I adjure you by the, by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this, but the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> and the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this became known to all residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon all of them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Okay. Uh, kind of an interesting little passage, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. <laughs> One of the things about that tradition about the, the name, uh, there was a belief at that time that if you knew the name of a, a spirit, like an evil spirit, the only way that could be overcome would be to have a higher power, mm -hmm. a higher one with more power say that name. You know, in other words, you use mm -hmm. the name of that spirit. So if George was kind of a mild spirit, and Sam was a higher spirit. You'd say Sam and George would get out of there. Uh, they had a little more fancy names and stuff that they used. But what was the highest name? What did the spirits end up recognizing was the one that... Jesus. Jesus. Jesus was the name. Certainly wasn't an evil spirit, but it was the one with the most power. And when they used that name, these other spirits got out of there, um, and this other spirits jumped on them. You just evoked him and got him on our case and beat up on the smaller spirits. Now that sounds almost comical in a way to us, yeah. but... Yeah. But it's interesting also to say that the spirit knew about Paul. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that shows the power of God's spirit in Paul. Yeah. Is this allegorical, or did something like this actually happen? How's that for a question? Isn't uh, isn't the answer an answer to that? Is is there any signal in there that this is allegorical, and I don't see that? No. No. We tend to want to think of it as allegorical, but yeah. the, the spirit world is real. Yeah. And and um, there is some spiritual warfare going on, and it just means we aren't aware of it sometimes. Here it is. He, uh, to the point that he ran out of the house naked and bleeding, 
Uh, I'm sure too. The spirit's there is pretty real. That that sounds real. You, you know, it, if it were allegorical, it probably would not have used that il illustration. It sounds like real right. stuff. And when this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. That's one of the other things that we can tell that it was real, is out the outcome. The outcome, okay. Was that Jesus was revered from this and held in high honor. And many of those who believe now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. They recognized, you know, I am a sinner. And a number who can practice sorcery brought them up brought their scrolls together. Remember those letters that I mentioned? The total came to 50,000 drachmas. A drachma was a, a silver coin with about a day's wages. So that was worth 50,000 uh, days work. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. After all this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia. And Achaia. After this, I, after I had been there, he said, I, what's the next word there? Is it Rome? Is it Rome? I must, must visit Rome. You ever had something where you feel you must do something? Who's, where, who's telling him he must? Who's God? God. God is the one who's directing all this. It's not something that happens just on his, on his face. Then we come across a silversmith, and I'll try to talk fast because we're going to go five minutes. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis. And he was bringing in lots of money. I mean, this was a going business. And the more he, these little statues that he sold, the more money he could make. Um, but what was getting worried? <laughs> what happened? What did Paul say? And you see in here now how the spell of Paul has yeah. made the Yeah. 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 God is the creator, not the created. And he goes on about the fact that the, um, when the other people began to hear this, they're going, uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> We've been making all these statues. People are putting them in their house because they think it brings power. What really brings power? The creator, right? Not the created. And so all of a sudden, people are saying, I don't need those statues anymore. They don't do anything. Why would that upset the silversmiths? <laughs> there goes their business. So they're kind of stuck with that. And the whole city was in a uproar. The people gave, grabbed, seized Gaius and Aristarchus from Macedonia and rushed just one man into the theater. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Why not? Is it a mob for fear of the mob? It was a mob. Um, it, really, I mean, it, Paul, sometimes Paul stayed and took the beatings. Other times he didn't. He was let down in the basket first and so the side of the wall. Well, who makes the difference? Who makes that decision? How do we know when to stay, when to go? Hopefully God leads us. God leads us, and that's one of the things that Paul did too. Um, there's this whole confusion. People are pushing each other. There's all kinds of yelling and shouting going on. And they're beginning to yell, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. We've got to get our story out here, folks, and counteract this other story. Does this sound like our elections? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> One side saying great as are, and the other saying great as are, and so on and so forth. So what happens then? We have someone come in. Is 
city clerk quieted the crowd. Again, we have, we have a town clerk, and he's yeah. more than a town clerk. Yeah, he's again the top guy in town. It's this town clerk, but he's really more the magistrate and the chief judge. He's the one who keeps the books and does all those things too. And he wouldn't have tolerated any civil disturbance because it would reflect on him. And this is Rome. We know what Rome's like now. Although it has a Greek culture, it is also a Roman culture. So he had two reasons to keep it quiet. Um, mainly because he, he wanted to keep the peace but also keep his own skin. How did this help the Christians, having someone like that there? We're coming up on an election. Was this guy a believer? No. No. It says, it says he was not a believer. But he kept the, he kept the veil. The face. Did God use him? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I bring that up partly because of their elections coming up. You know, we, we we would like to have someone who walks with God, and listens to God, and whose purpose is to work further the kingdom. Why in this case, wise? in this case, the guy did without being a believer. Mm -hmm. um, he was used by God. God uses people. Yeah. Um, you never expect. <laughs> <laughs> hard decisions and hard, hard thoughts and stuff like that. Um, let's see if there's anything else. Well, he says, and it's kind of interesting, it says in verse 40, as it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of today's events. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there's no reason for it. Mm -hmm. so just kind of... Here's a question that was on your thing, and the real, there's two questions that we didn't quite get to that were really good ones. Um, one is one of the things that was in our writing here too. Is it says a church that is not learning the scriptures, especially, cannot be well prepared, prepared to proclaim and defend. Would you agree with that? That's kind of what Kathy was saying earlier. That we need to know the scriptures and be ready to defend them. There was a question though that was asked in your thing about where do you see the evidence that the kingdom of God is breaking through in our society today? Are there issues where there's conflict between Christians and non-Christians where things are out of it to come some growth? Do you see any of that going on? I wrote down the growth of like charitable organizations, you know, that help people. I think that's something Christians are called to do to help others. And I know if we listen to where people are at, you know, kind of your same thing you're saying here, if we listen to what the other sides are saying, if you will, and then truly look at ourselves, and say, are we doing what we should be doing? Um, there's things that we should be doing. Maybe in a different way, with a different motor than what they're doing. But there are things we should do. I think the Right to Life did a good thing when they moved simply from criticizing and condemning abortion to helping unwed mothers and, right. and providing for them rather than just say you're a sinner. You know, offering to take the stress in. the positive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Moving from anti abortion to life. Mm -hmm. you know, how is the life of both the child and the mother to be affected? Yeah. That's a, a way perhaps. Third work, Planned Parenthood kills kill, plan parent about 58 babies every minute. That's terrible. In this country. 58 every minute. That's a lot of words. Yeah. And, and, and like Marcus is saying, when you start to say, let's find ways, alternatives for you. Mm -hmm. That makes a big difference. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another question was, why was it necessary for Christ to die? Well, uh, 
you know, we, we can't do it ourselves. We live a perfect life and die. And our blood, why did he have to die? Because that's a stomach plot for a lot of people. To save us. For the sin of the world. That's why we have to die. takes away the sin. Yeah. He's the only one that could keep the law. Yeah. We have that original sin. We can't, we can't do it ourselves. The only way it could be removed is through Christ and through that propitiation, the big word, of our sins. And so that is really important. Um, how should it be? How should, one other question, how should the government official, it's not a believer, but he defended Christians, um, how should we respond when someone does that? With joy. <laughs> With joy. Thank God for intervening. Mm -hmm. Well, right to that person, first of right. all, I thought, you know, let's be a little proactive here. Them Praise them for their actions and uh, thank them. You know, encourage them. Well, yesterday was citizenship day. Was it? Yeah. And on the Christian radio station, they said they posted a whole oh. list or on their computer thing, you know. All, all the officials, and they said, just call somebody up and just say, thanks for thanks serving. For serving. Yep. Don't or make it don't bipartisan, just else. thanks for don't, serving. Yeah, I heard. Don't I, have any agenda, yeah. just say thanks for serving. Mm -hmm. you know, often I always consider when there's only one candidate during the office, and I think, you know, well, I don't, I, I go online usually to check them all out, but I think just because they're willing to serve, you know, it's reason to vote for them. And also, just, you don't want an ulterior motive, but I will tell you, having had you know, a, a daughter, for instance, that's worked in government, or a son-in-law that's worked in government, um, when they hear a group is supporting them without asking something in return, right. Right. they're aware of it. Yeah. Right. They're aware of it. They hear the other things. Let's close the group. Did anyone else have anything else that was burning to them, too, because I kind of... A lot of some extra things in the area. Look at the real life. very good, Carol. Yeah. <laughs> so, let's close some prayer. Father, we are living in a world that we sometimes don't know how to live the way you want us to live. Help us to remember to do as Paul did, to find out where people are from. What is their, what are, where are they at? Listen to them, ask the questions, and then share you with them. Help them to see your power, your strength, the Holy Spirit, and how it can guide us and give that motor to our life. Thank you, Father, for those who are in service, who are in government positions, and those who are considered above us in this culture that do allow us to continue to worship you. Help us to encourage them and through our example, influence them. Thank you, Father, for caring so much about each of us that you sent your son and made the ultimate sacrifice for each of us. In your loving name we ask. Amen. Thank you. 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 Thank you.